places and go to see a rental agent to check on a number of points. Listen to the conversation between your friend and the rental agent and complete the list. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hi, we've been looking over your listing of apartments for rent and we have a few questions about a couple of the apartments. Can you help us? Sure. Yep, yeah, this is our most recent listing. What would you like to know? Well, we were first wondering about the house on 3rd Street. We can see that it is furnished and rents for $135 a week, but can you tell us how many bedrooms it has? Let's see. In addition to the den, it has three bedrooms. The rental on 3rd Street has three bedrooms. So in the example, three bedrooms has been written down in the number of rooms column for 19 3rd Street. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hi, we've been looking over your listing of apartments for rent, and we have a few questions about a couple of the apartments. Can you help us? Sure. Yep, yeah, this is our most recent listing. What would you like to know? Well, we were first wondering about the house on 3rd Street. We can see that it is furnished and rents for $135 a week, but can you tell us how many bedrooms it has? Let's see. In addition to the den, it has three bedrooms. What about the one on Route 9N? It looks like it's big with a library and a deck, but it doesn't say how much it costs or anything else about it. Oh yes, Mrs Gaylor's apartment. That one is actually only a 10-month rental and it is going for $156 per week. It's quite a nice place. She only rents for 10 months each year because of horse racing season. Then her relatives all come to stay, so tenants have to move out. It's a little bit inconvenient, but past tenants have really enjoyed their stay there. Oh, well, we need it for a full year. I guess that one is out. How about the rental on Broen Drive? How many rooms does that one have? As it says on the list, it has two bedrooms and a private kitchen and bath. But it's actually a very small place. That's why it's a bit cheaper. Oh. Well then, what about the one that has three large rooms? Who is renting that property? That one is a good deal. Mr John Smith is renting it. But he's quite eccentric and he has a strict rule about no pets. How about cats? Nope. Absolutely no pets. Hmm. Well then, how about this studio apartment rented by Mr Bo Jensen? How is that one? That ad is actually a bit deceptive. The studio apartment is the whole upper floor of an older house. It's actually very large and, at $45 a week, quite affordable. And it's near campus. I think I'd like to check that one out. Do you have a telephone number that we can call? It's not on the list? Oh, it isn't. Here it is. You should ring area code 518 and then 543-7790. Thanks. I think I'll call on that one first. Your friend decides that he would like to talk to Mr. Bo Jensen. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Hello? 1512, Route 9. Yes. Is this Mr Jensen? 
Yes, it is. Can I help you? Yeah, we're studying here at university, and we came across the rental information for the studio apartment that you are renting. Is it still available? Yes, of course. I actually just placed the ad, and you're the first person to call. Is there anything you'd like to know about it? Yes, actually, there is. As students, we are on the internet a lot, and we heard that some homes in the area have high-speed connections. What type of connection do you have there now? Oh, <laughs> that's an interesting first question, but I guess I have heard that too. But we just have a phone line here, nothing fancy. I think you can have a cable line installed, but it's just a phone line for now. Okay, well maybe we can do that. What type of heating does the apartment have? Now there's a more traditional question. We have oil heat here. It's an older house. That tends to be a little more expensive during the winter, right? Yeah, but there's nothing to do about it. It would cost too much for me to put in a gas heater. What else would you like to know about the apartment? Well, we heard it was quite big. Is it furnished? Actually, yes. I should have put that in the ad. It has an old couch and a couple chairs, a dining table, refrigerator, stove, and even a dishwasher. Does it have any beds? Yep, it has two. That sounds great. When is the apartment available? You can have it tomorrow night if you want. I just have to clean up a couple things before you get here. Do you want to come over and see it first? No, it sounds fine to us. I actually know the street too, so I know the area. We'll take it. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 2 You will hear the head teacher of a school giving a talk to parents about some new classrooms. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 14. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for making it along. I know how busy you all are with term coming to an end. As you know, the aim of this meeting is to show you the plans we've got to add two new classrooms and how that will affect the playground. Now, I've heard that quite a few of you are worried that there'll be hardly any playground left, but I want to reassure you that that's not the case at all. I think there's been quite a lot of uninformed talk going on, and people have started worrying unduly. I certainly hope I can dispel any of your concerns this evening. Firstly, I have a plan of what the school should look like, which I'll project onto the screen. The school governors and the developers want to hear your feedback before making final decisions. Your feedback's very important. When I've gone through the plan with you, you can ask questions and we'll discuss those queries in detail. There'll be plenty of time to tell us what you think over the coming weeks. And once the plans are a little more developed, they'll be available online. There'll be a weekly update, and once the actual construction begins, you'll be able to check progress as it happens. Personally, I'm very happy with where we've got to. I knew we had to have the extra space, but I must admit I worried long and hard about what we might have to sacrifice for it. 
The developers have certainly convinced me that we've made the right decision. You now have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the talk and answer questions 15 to 20. Right, can everyone see the plan now? Good. Let's start at the Balfour Road entrance, since that's where most of you come and go from. The Farley Road entrance and lower playground won't be affected at all. Now... As you come into the top playground, the two new classrooms will be on the right. There'll be a new gate and the steps down will be rebuilt. There'll be a ramp for disabled visitors too. On the plan here, only the parts of the building affected by the plans are shown. I'll explain why the hall is marked on later. So, as I said... The new classrooms will be to the right of the entrance and, as you can see, will take up very little of the playground space. We feel the Year 6 children need their own area away from the younger children. So, this one on the left of the two rooms will be the new Year 6 classroom. As you can see, there's no direct entrance from the playground. The plan is to include a small entrance area here from the playground for coats and boots and so on. Entrance to the classroom will be from that area. There will also be an additional entrance to the hall from this cloakroom so children will be able to get to the hall from two different directions from inside the main building and from the new entrance area. I hope that's clear. Now, as you all know, the hall doubles up as the cafeteria at lunchtime. One of the rumours I heard was that we're planning to dispense with the cafeteria and open up a snack bar. I can categorically state that replacing healthy school meals with a snack bar is not remotely in our thoughts. The other new classroom, that's the one with the playground entrance here, is going to be an exciting new venture for us. That's because its principal use will be for the preschool and after-school clubs. More and more parents want that facility outside school hours and we need a dedicated space to run these activities. I think there were also worries about the nursery school, though I'm not really sure why, to be honest with you. I can tell you now that the whole area on the other side of the main school building will be totally unaffected. The nursery will continue operating as it does now. There will be a couple of smaller constructions, modernisation work really, down here on the other side of the top playground. Cycling into school is getting more and more popular, so we're replacing the old bike sheds with a brand new bicycle bay. There'll be space for 60 bikes. The children's toilets will also be modernised and the children will be able to enter them from inside the school building rather than from the playground as they do now. There'll be brand new staff toilets in that part of the building too, I'm pleased to say. So, I hope that's at least started to allay a few fears. Take a few minutes to look at the plan, but I'll get out of the way. Then I'll answer a few questions if you have any. Does that make sense to you? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part 3. Part 3 You are going to hear a conversation between an interviewer and a professor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 21 to 26. Today I'm here with Professor Nitik, who is our new university president. He has been a professor for 20 years and teaches many of the best classes on campus. I know many of you have had him as a teacher and know of his brilliance. Good morning, Professor Nitik. Thank you for stopping by the student station. Thank you for having me here. It is always great to get to meet many of the students who are involved with our school. I haven't been here since two years ago. Yes, I remember at that time you were still teaching every semester. Two years later, you are only teaching every once in a while. But it seems like you are still always busy. The administration world is just as busy as the teaching world for you. How do you stay in touch with the university, even with the change in your everyday duties? I try to stay in touch with what is popular with the university students. I usually spend time with as many students as I can. They usually give me insight into what the new concerns and beliefs are for the new generation. On top of that, I try to be as youthful as I can. I consider myself to be youthful, at least for my age. So I always have a good time and try to stay young. I try my best to not just be a teacher, but also participate in university life. Interesting. So, are you still doing lots of academic work, or are you mostly concentrating on administrative affairs? Well, I mostly do administrative affairs now, but that doesn't mean that I still don't have a very deep interest in academic matters. I often visit other campuses around the world and meet other professors in my field. I learn the most by travelling and seeing the different places of the world and the different fields of thought. I even did a television program last month in Manchester. Will you be on television any time soon then? Well, you can call the television station and see if I will be on television any time soon. Maybe I will be on the news report. I don't think it is really that significant though. Oh really? That sounds great. I will remember to look out for you. Let's move on. With all your busy travelling recently, how do you find time for your personal life? I try to keep my university life separate from my personal life. Sometimes it's hard to find time to just take my wife and three kids out for a family dinner, but usually we all manage to get together every few days. I'm taking a few weeks off next month to take my family down to South America, to Brazil for a few days. I can't wait to just sit on the beach. Wow, that sounds like a wonderful trip. Professor Nitik, could you tell the audience a little about what goes on in an average day of a university administrator? <laughs> An average day? Oh, I don't think there is such thing as an average day for me. The last few weeks I've been travelling all the time. I can be in Los Angeles in the morning and in New York by the afternoon and back to Los Angeles by the evening. Sometimes I will spend the whole week at a new university, showing the new administrators the ins and outs of running a university. Sometimes I can spend the whole day in the office on the phone. So there really is no average day for me. I guess that is because I do so many different tasks. Sorry to let all the viewers down, but that is the plain truth. Now look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 27 to 30. Well, I guess I can sum it up for them. You are a busy man. That is probably a good description. 
So, are there any immediate plans for the coming few weeks? Well, I'm in Los Angeles for the next two days, and then I fly to Colorado to meet a new prospective professor for our university. I will be in Colorado for about a week. Then I go to Japan for the next ten days to meet with our university branch in Japan about record sales there. After that, I return to Los Angeles for a week, just in time for the graduation of the class of 2001. There you have it, my next month's schedule. Thank you very much, Professor Nitik. I always enjoy having you on our show. We hope to have you back on our show next time. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear the first part of one lecture in a series of lectures about environmental issues. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. In this lecture series, we have been looking at the most pressing environmental issues that the world faces. One of those issues, global warming, has become very fashionable to talk about in the past decade. Though I'm not trying to diminish its importance as a problem, it must be understood that the effects of an increasingly warm planet will not be seen for many more decades. One problem affecting the lives of people right now is the scarcity of water. The need for fresh water will only increase as the world's population grows, especially in developing countries. In the future, changing weather patterns that come with global warming will only make the problem worse. People need water to drink, cook food, shower, and wash clothes. Most of the planet is covered with water, but unfortunately, only a tiny percentage of it is fit for human use. Of all the water in the world, less than three percent is fresh water. More than two thirds of that remaining percentage is locked up in glaciers in Greenland, Antarctica, and elsewhere, also unavailable for human use. The water vital for life comes from lakes, rivers, underground aquifers, rain, and snow. This surface water, groundwater, and precipitation is not disturbed equally across the Earth's surface. For example, Canada, which has about one half of one percent of the world's people, contains about ten percent of the world's readily available fresh water. Brazil makes up about three percent of the world's population, but within its borders contain nearly twelve percent of the world's freshwater resources. As the economies of developing countries grow, the need for fresh water also grows. One example of this has to do with the production of meat. In some countries, the demand for beef increases when people earn more money. However, raising cattle is incredibly water-intensive. Requiring about fifteen tons of water for one kilogram of grain-fed beef. The scarcity of water has a direct impact on human life. When people are forced to walk many kilometers to the nearest source of fresh water, it may take hours away from their day. This, in turn, takes time away from school or from other productive work that helps the general economy. A number of solutions have been proposed to deal with the scarcity of water. Some of them are technological, like the construction of desalination plants. 
These plants convert brackish salty seawater into water fit for human use. They are very expensive to operate and maintain, though, and cannot meet the world's growing demand for water. Other kinds of solutions involve only a little technology or involve modifying individual people's habits. In a rural part of India, a village facing water shortage started collecting rainwater. A simple system allowed them to save water that fell over a large area and use it during dry periods. In the suburbs that surround the cities of developed countries, house owners are using xeriscaping techniques. The main purpose of xeriscaping, unlike traditional landscaping, is not to use supplemental irrigation. This requires the use of plants, shrubs, and trees that are appropriate for the climate. In dry areas, this means planting ones that use less water. In the future, many countries will need to use a variety of these techniques in order to provide enough water for their citizens. Water security will be of utmost importance to those governments, especially in areas that are politically unstable.